You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to adding life to your years. And now your hosts, registered dietitian Juliana Hever and scientist Ray Cronus. Welcome. Hello, hello. Here we are, this time coming to you from California. Yes, we are. California dreaming. That's right. Sunny California, my home away from home. I had to run out to fries because there's never enough cables. There's never enough cables and there's never enough adapters. <laughs> but it's so exciting because now we can actually do this in both of our homes. It's very exciting. We are, we are ready to go. So we thought we would talk about something that we talk about all the time and it's what we both believe to be the most confusing thing about nutrition. The reason for all of the mass confusion from the levels of, you know, anyone, the layperson reading a blog post, all the way up to researchers and healthcare practitioners. And what's so fun about this is that before Raymond and I had met, we were both going around saying the same crazy stuff. We were both saying... Carbs are not a food group. Protein's not a food group. And, you know, people looked at us like we had two heads. But even more funny is that we both had created our own memes that say carbs are not a food group. (laughs) So it was exciting to say, oh, my goodness, it wasn't just me saying this. And we both kind of had figured out that using this language of carbs, protein and fat makes everything not make sense. You know, we get these studies that come out that quite literally will say high fat diet and low fat diet increase mortality, for an example. And it's like, well, wait, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what, yeah. what does that even mean? You know, it's so ridiculous. It, it's really, it really is. And when you first say something to someone, when you first say, just stop using protein, carbs, and fat, most people have this really big pushback they they can't grasp the idea of just talking about food and it's really important i mean to to talk about macro confusion at its most basic level it's really simple to say that when we eat things certain foods within these groups aren't metabolically similar And so what do I mean by that? So, you know, whether you're for sugar or against sugar, I think it should be obvious to everybody that taking an equal calorie of apple juice and an equal calorie of apples, eating that apple, drinking that apple juice, equivalent calories, those will elicit a different metabolic response. And then if I want to even further put that difference, I would say, okay, now we want to take an equal calorie of apple juice and brown rice. And people should see or know that even though the carb content of those, because the calories would be primarily from carbohydrates, uh, one would be a more complex starch and one of them would be more of a simple sugar. But without the dietary fiber, without the other elements that you would find in that brown rice versus that apple juice, you're going to see a metabolic difference. If I go further and talk about a legume, if I talk about black beans, what ends up happening is that we see that the nature of these things changes and metabolic similarity changes or dissimilarity in some cases. And of course, the person who's more educated on this will say, well, well, of course, because you're talking about simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates, and they go into all of these other details. But the net net is that as long as we're designing studies that balance protein, carbs, and fat on both sides of the study, we don't get at the fundamental difference from food. And so what ends up happening with this is that we adulterate one side maybe to bring up protein and another side to bring up carbohydrate and another side to bring up fat. And what we're doing is just adding these simple 
non-isometabolic, meaning not metabolically similar, compounds to both sides of the study, and we end up getting contradictions. And yet, that's exactly the problem, is that the research papers themselves actually calculate those foods as the same because they are basing it exclusively on their macronutrient composition. So basically you will have apple juice, candy, you know, all these things that are very, very refined, um, uh, white flour, all in the same category and comparing that to something else. And, and then that's just lumped together as carbs. And this is so, the, it is so confusing because they are so dissimilar in the way we metabolize them. And it's so dissimilar when you're actually trying to describe to people what, what has the disadvantage, what has the benefit and, you know, what, why it doesn't matter exactly what their macronutrient profile is essentially. And to make it even more confusing is that if you look at most or pretty much all intact whole foods, they have protein, carbohydrate, and fat in some ratio. You know, it's not like a potato. We love to use the potato as an example because it actually happens, and we talk about this in the book, it actually happens to have a better amino acid score than 90% lean beef, gram for gram, which is quite crazy if you think about it because, you know, people think they say potatoes are carbs. Like they always put those in, they've lumped everything into this category of carbs, you know, I'm, an, I'm eating too many carbs and that's the problem. Well, no, because what does that even mean? Yeah. So, so before we go off on protein, cause that's a whole different part of this, let's just stick with dietary carbohydrate for a second, because right now sugar is vilified. There's so many people that just believe glucose is the single threat for a while people thought fat was a single threat. Um, I don't know that protein's ever been on the threat list, but certainly excess amino acids, excess protein in the diet is not the best option for all things. And I so let's let's back up a little bit and talk about what our goal is because you know ultimately what Julian and I are discussing is health span. So there may be other dietary interventions if you're, for example, if you're interested in, you know, prime athletic performance, or if you're interested in reproductive prime, or if you're interested in other kinds of focus, there may be, you know, if you're a, an advanced cardiovascular patient, you know, the, the kind of diet you would have right after that might be different than one that you would have after the the cardiovascular system is more healed or if you're a recent um, uh, hypertensive patient there's some changes that someone might have and you might have a higher sensitivity to sodium but bringing it back to this protein carbs and fat why we believe that discussing food and organizing food in terms of that causes a problem really gets off i think it's really easy to get off onto the carbohydrate side right now because so many people universally condemn sugar in fact when you say the word sugar if you think about it i would say most people listening right now when they hear the word sugar there's probably a negative connotation that they hear they don't see it as something that is one of these fuel sources that our body can use very efficiently. We do very well. Um, there is a whole group of people out there that now have condemned glucose. They've gone even further, which is, you know, this monosaccharide, just this single molecule. In fact, it's the, it's the only molecule that every living cell can metabolize. And yet people go so far as to vilify that. And why is this a problem? Well, because sugar alone, is not the issue. Now, when we're talking about sugar, I'm not talking about adding tablespoons of this white stuff or, you know, the little package of sugar, of raw sugar, and just putting it on something. But to really get at this a little bit better, if we use the word carbohydrate to sort of be this overarching category that sugar is a, is a part of, imagine 
if I had a bowl of breakfast cereal and, you know, we'll just put, we'll just put a, you know, a nut milk in there for right now, just so that for the people that see a difference in dairy. So we'll just use nut milk. And then I had a bowl of lentil stew. Now I ask you, even if the carbohydrate was exactly the same in these two bowls, does anyone really believe that breakfast cereal and lentil stew are going to be nutritionally similar or metabolically similar? And then this is what leads to people saying things like fruit is bad. You know, things that where they're just putting it all together and saying, oh, carbs are bad. And then grouping certain foods into that category. So yeah, it could be the same. If you're, if you're consuming a breakfast cereal, it's a completely different animal or plant than consuming a lentil stew that's chock full of fiber and phytonutrients and it's not refined and it does have a completely different metabolic reaction and, and uh, result. So it's, it's just that language, the language of using these macronutrients, which I would love for you to talk about the origin of it because Essentially, these were just terms of biochemistry that were used, what, 150 years 170 ago? years ago. 170 years ago to, you know, that was important at that time. But now it's just being misused and we're missing the whole point. Right. And, and, I, and to take this even a step further, when if you go back to the time when you were doing your registered dietitian, when you were doing your internship or whatever it is mm. you do oh. af- after that, and you were doing the school lunch program oh, stuff. Talk, talk about that story for just a second, because I think this captures why oversimplification, over-controlling, over-categorization causes otherwise smart people to make silly decisions. Yes, this is crazy to think about in retrospect. It was crazy at the moment. So I was doing my internship and I won't mention any names or schools or anything, but I had to do, you know, for your internship, you have to do a lot of clinical and food service and schools and, um, you know, counseling. Like you have to basically try every kind of part of the whole world of dietetics, which is quite broad. So during my food service rotation at a school district nearby, I was, my job at this time for a few days was to input the consumption, the, what the children were eating at school and put it into the database and submit it to the USDA because it was as part of the school lunch program. They want to ensure that the children are getting meeting these specific standards. Like there's a bunch of specific standards that they need to meet in terms of macronutrition, you know, where are they, how much are they getting? Like they have, to, I don't remember what the numbers were because this was many years ago. <laughs> I can't even imagine how long this has been. Um, but so I was putting, I was inputting the data and it has to meet a certain standard so that the USDA will continue to provide, you know, all of these, these foods and the, all the funding and everything for the school district. So, okay. So here I am typing in numbers and I realized, Ooh, the fat percentage was slightly high. It was higher than what they want us to have. And so I turned to my preceptor and I told her what was happening. And she said, oh, no problem. Just put in more ketchup because ketchup (laughs) is high in sugar, high in carbohydrates. And that would change the ratio of protein carbohydrates to fat. And it was horrifying to me because first of all, I don't know if they were eating more ketchup and just to kind of mask you know, that their burger had, you know, too much fat. We're just going to add some more ketchup and just mess it all up. And it just so messed up anyway. It just, it was horrifying to think that that's how we're deciding. And I, I always say this too, the two most vulnerable populations in the world, right? Our children and our infirm, people that are sick. And if you think about schools and you think about hospitals, that is where the most damaging, detrimental, horrifying food is being served on a regular basis. So there's a perfect example. We're feeding our children just awful food and we're supporting it by messing with carbs, protein, and fat ratios. Right. Right. And then, and then you think about it from the other perspective in terms of servings of vegetables, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, look, technically, yes, a tomato is a fruit, but we kind of think of it as a vegetable, but here we go. We talk about tomato, which is this, look, ketchup in quantity is not in itself an issue, right? However, when you think about a serving of ketchup being equivalent to a certain fruit or vegetable serving, 
okay, yes, there's some lycopene in there. But it's this kind of quantifying factor that I think leads us to really bad decisions. And, you know, what Juliana was talking about going back historically, if we started in Lavoisier, we talked about metabolism last week with uh, Kevin and the early part of understanding metabolism was understanding that respiration and combustion were identical chemical processes. In other words, a flame and the chemical process is happening in every one of your cells of your body right now uh, that basically consumes or oxidizes that fuel and then produces carbon dioxide and water. So we, we use the oxygen to do the oxidation and then we produce the carbon dioxide as water as the byproducts. And what we talked about last week is, you know, we could actually measure that pretty precisely. We could measure the oxygen in we can measure you know, the carbon dioxide out and we can use those ratios to talk about the fuel that was burned. Well, bringing it back to Lavoisier, after oxygen is discovered and we know well how metabolism is working, the next step with this was to figure out what the fuels were. And for the better part of the 19th century, really, there was a belief that, you know, for example, muscles only burn the protein portion. So these categories, these biochemistry categories that Juliana alluded to earlier, proteins, um, they were called proteoids at the time, or saccharines, which were the uh, carbohydrate form, or the fats, these categories of fuel were things that we could identify that were being burned. And so... Look, it was important at that time to understand that we had three different fuels. And it was also important in understanding as sort of a first approximation for food to recognize that plants and animals, uh, food, had these different fuels. And so when we looked at it and did these classifications, you know, 200 years ago, this was a good first approximation. But as we moved forward, and this is really particularly important as we get to the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we became a society, especially in the United States, but it was also worldwide, we became a society that quantified things. Uh, economics, uh, classifying, quantifying became a really big, important uh, part of sort of the Industrial Revolution. When we were in this place where we were, how many bushels of something was being produced, how much fertilizer was being consumed. There was this, really this obsession on accounting. And, you know, there's actually some, some really great books that, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll go into some of these articles and things in the future that go into that, because that could probably be a podcast all to itself. But being able to quantify things was increasingly more important for the government. And so as we get to the end of the 19th century, uh, through uh, the research of a couple of, of scientists, uh, the German uh, science, scientists, uh, von Voigt, also a guy by the name of Pettenkofer, Rubner was another one, and Atwater, we know uh, everybody probably is familiar with the Atwater factors, which is the when we look at the calories of per gram of protein, carbs, and fat. This is the, the nine, four, and four number or 8.1, four, and four, whatever number you want to use for that. But, but that uh, quantification of how many calories per gram is in, this was all part of this quantifying uh, societal focus. And it is important. It's not that it isn't useful at all. But what's happened is, is that we've really come a century later to the other side of this where it's become primarily a term of marketing. So it's labels and we have all these labels with calories and daily values and, you know, all these different things. I mean, the, the, we could go into the food label as a whole nother issue that we have to at some point clear up, but, uh, you know, protein, you know, right now manufacturers, we're sort of in a pro protein era right now where manufacturers know that if they slap protein on the label, you're probably going to pick it up. And really, <laughs> that's not 
the salient characteristic of that food. And, and even if you're not plant-based at this point, you know, if you look at our food triangle that we introduced in metabolic winter hypothesis and look at oxidative priority paper, and we look at the food triangle, even those amino acid profiles of proteins, and we'll talk about what that means in just a second, but even those change drastically based on what that source is. Well, wait, before you go there, let's actually talk about that. That's what was really exciting is that I was going around complaining that carbs are not a food group and worrying about people obsessing about this, but you actually found a solution. And, you know, I've obviously adopted the solution too, and I think it is a great way of changing this dialogue. So the whole point is stop using these biochemistry terms and actually go back to food. Talk about a lentil stew instead of a breakfast cereal. People know what that looks like. They know what that means. They have the idea, oh, this is refined. It's probably not going to be so good for me versus a lentil stew, which you know that you know that it's good for you. It's got all these vegetables and lentils. So it's you've figured out a way to ch- to bring that conversation now into a better time, even though we're still accounting, we're still going, we're still in that era. I mean, that hasn't shifted that much. We are all about that and highlighted even probably more so, but that's because we have the internet and marketing is everywhere, uh, more, you know, more available, hyper accessible. So this food triangle is a great answer. And what I love about it when I was first introduced to it, when we started collaborating was that you can explain you know, all of the different trendy diets or versions of different diets and do it in terms of food. And that is key because no longer do we have to explain, you know, oh, the like, I mean, I wrote a book about it. The vegetarian diet is all about, well, why is there this diet that's really high in fat, if you will, um, and really high in olive oil and all of these myths surrounding this quote unquote gold standard for the perfect diet, the healthiest way to eat. And what I love about the food triangle is it brings a conversation away from biochemistry and back to actual food groups. And, and, and you're able to talk about food in a more proactive way where we could actually make decisions and recommendations looking at that and we could explain like when someone says, well wait i'm on the keto diet and i'm feeling great well you could explain exactly why just right. by using that food triangle it's an amazing tool yeah so what happened there is that david sinclair who's at harvard who was a collaborator on metabolic with their hypothesis and then uh andrew bremer who is now at nih but at the time he was at vanderbilt medical school he's a uh, phd md pediatric endocrinologist so in talking to both of them we were looking at the positive benefits of mild cold stress and how these positive benefits of mild cold stress, what, what's happening at the cellular level, at the mitochondrial level, actually at the subcellular level, the, the little power plants inside the cell, we were trying to relate those to dietary restriction. And so dietary restriction without malnutrition, this goes back to you know, McKay back in you know, 1935 in terms of some of the first experiments that were done with rats where they restricted the, at the time, calories. And through restricting those calories, they were able to make these rats live longer. Well, prog- as this progresses through uh, the 20th century and as we get to the end, some of the work that David's lab and other labs are doing is, hey, it's not really just calories, but when we restrict calories, i.e., when we restrict rat chow or monkey chow or other kinds of feed that was given to organisms they were testing, we're really restricting nutrients, specific nutrients. And it turned out that there were specific amino acids. These are the building blocks of proteins. There are these specific amino acids that were at least in part responsible for some of these benefits. So as the three of us were discussing this, one thing kept coming up as a recurrent theme, which is that animals and plants concentrate nutrition in a fundamentally different way. And so I just, I remember one call we were having with David on the phone, we were talking about, and he said, well, you know, what we're really talking about, Ray, is that, you know, fuzzy things and green things just have a very different, you know, nutritional composition. And I said, you know, this is exactly right. But then there was the other side of it. So if we really talk about a lot of people that have had the, let's just say the vegan versus paleo debate, 
so that, you know, I, I'm, and I'm going to leave out the carnivore diet for just a second, because I want to talk about ones that sort of have the triangle. So to visualize the food triangle, you have at the top of the food triangle, you have high fiber foods like, you know, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, uh, you know, you have mushrooms up there. We put bulbs like garlic and onions, stems like uh, asparagus or celery. And these higher fiber, lower calorie foods are things that are top triangle foods. They're probably the least energy dense of all the foods, but they do have a wide range of nutrition and so they can't be ignored. And down one descending side... Well, um, not only not be ignored, they should be the foundation of a daily diet. But a lot of people put them as calorie neutral and calorie becomes the salient feature of diet. Is something high calorie or something low calorie? But what I'm saying in this context and what we were talking about was these are things that you could add a lot of them, for example, to a diet and maybe not change the calorie content much. So down one descending side of the triangle, we had animal source food. And now, of course, as that animal source food is increasing in calorie content, what we're really talking about is probably a little bit more protein because animals tend to concentrate protein more than, than plant foods and a little bit more fat. You know, there are some exceptions like milk, for example, that has a higher you know, in terms of lactose has a higher sugar content, but down the animal source side, the idea was, is that as we add animal products, we're primarily adding more fat, but, but we are adding calorie density. So you take a big plate of greens and you throw some salmon on it, or, you know, you throw some chicken on it. What you're ending up doing is you're ending up adding more calories to the overall dish and it's changing the nutritional composition. Likewise on the plant base side of this so on the ant plant source side of this we're really adding you know simple sugars and starches so for this example is at the bottom right the of bottom, the triangle bottom right yeah so we would be adding for example you know a potato uh, to that salad or we would be adding beans to that salad or we would be adding fruit. some blueberries or fruit etc or oranges or watermelon oh i love the grilled watermelon salad in our book so there's probably someone listening here that when they hear ch chicken breast, they can't help but think of lean protein only because you've been taught to think that way, not necessarily because it's true. And when you hear about this fruit, all you can think of is, well, this is sugar. This is sugar or a potato. This is starch, this or rice. This turns to sugar in my blood. So these are oversimplifications of how we see food. And yes, it's true that nuts and seeds uh, on the plant side are higher in fat. So are avocados, so are coconut. But seeing this triangle, what David and Drew and I were really trying to get at is how could we segregate food, not just so that we could segregate calorie, because obviously if we look historically at these uh, longevity and health span studies, we would see that calorie restriction was part of it. They called it calorie restriction for a long time. But as well, there were these other elements of nutrition. And so what are some of those elements of nutrition that we would want to restrict? Well, I, I talked about this a little earlier, which is certain amino acids. Now, very quickly with the protein, protein isn't something like plastic. Proteins, plural, are manufactured in your cells, you know, specifically in the ribosomes, and proteins are synthesized real time as your body needs them. You don't consume proteins, plural, from other plants or animals and utilize those proteins, plural, in your body. A better way to look at it is, you know, like Wheel of Fortune. You have these 26 letters of the alphabet that make up, you know, the words, the sentence, the paragraphs, and, you know, the chapters of your genetic book of life. And likewise, when we're talking about proteins, there's tens of thousands of different proteins in each of your cell, and your body responds to other kinds of stimuli that generate those. For example, amino acids, the, the 51 or so amino acids that are in insulin, 
which is a protein. In fact, it's one of the first proteins that was ever sequenced, i.e. we we learned what those um, those amino acids are, what order are they in, and, and that long chain, what does that long chain eventually look like when it folds up into a, a 3D structure? So when we're talking about proteins, what we're really talking about is those 20 amino acids. And... Well, and, not, and we're really only talking about the essential amino acids, right. the nine essential amino acids right. that so, we can't make ourselves in right. our body. And in fact, not only do we not make those nine amino acids, no, none of the animal products that you would eat, none of the animals, none of those organisms make all 20 of them. You eat the plant or eat the animal that ate the plant, but plants must make all 20 amino acids. And this idea... And I don't know how it got started, but this idea that plants don't have these essential amino acids and that that's why we eat an animal product, this is just absolutely wrong. And or that or that we need to micromanage it and we need to get in <laughs> the complementary. Pro- I still to this day hear about complementary proteins. I eat my beans with my rice or I eat this with that because I need to get all of the essential amino acids all at one time, even though who, this idea that was that came up, I don't know, several decades ago was retracted. It's just right. it's not even true. But be even beyond that, this gets exactly to the point of why we wanted to use the food triangle and segregate animal and plant source nutrition. So what do we mean by that? Because it is true that animals tend to concentrate those essential amino acids. In other words, as we go up the food chain, organisms end up concentrating nutrition up the food tra- chain. You know, so So there are examples where you have a lot more concentration of those however these actually happen to also be the same amino acids that all of these longevity and health span experiments said we need to restrict to make the organism live longer so as long as we're talking about protein the very first thing it does is it ignores the distribution of these amino acids and if you then simply take a, you know, you take an overly simplistic view of this and say, well, our tissue has a higher concentration of these essential amino acids. And so therefore we should eat at a higher concentration of these essential amino acids. Well, this ignores a lot too. It ignores a lot too because the fact is we recirculate a lot of those essential amino acids when they're restricted in diet. So during a long-term fast, we end up not having all of these uh, amino acids because you don't have any protein coming in at that point. And while we're in that long-term fast, our bodies end up recirculating more and more and more of those amino acids, particularly the essential amino acids as the fast Uh, gets longer and longer. In fact, the reason why I went from a 14-day fast eventually to do a 24-day was because I was looking at when that point is when we recirculate the most. So, you know, bringing this full circle back to what Juliana was saying earlier is calling a food a protein or a lean protein like a chicken breast or a bean a protein or peanut butter a protein or whatever. We're just making this up. And when you don't manage it, you're likely not going to be deficient if your diet is primarily from whole food. And right now, I'm not even talking about just plant food. I'm saying if you're eating primarily foods which have names that you find on the food triangle, not eating oil, not eating refined sugar, not eating refined flours, not eating you know, very, very refined product, then mostly these things take care of themselves. That doesn't mean you can't eat too much, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you're referring to food by the real names that you would find on the food triangle, animal source food, plant source food, and then this lower calorie top triangle food, what you end up doing is naturally taking care of most of the nutritional concerns. Does that make sense? 
it just makes it so much simpler. And if we could just kind of start talking about it in a different way and stop marketing the heck out of one of these nutrients as if there's like some kind of health halo, you know, people really do see protein as a benefit as like, I mean, I, I, can't, I still like 15 years later have people coming to me all the time saying, I just can't get enough protein. I'm just worried about getting enough protein as if there's some magic thing about consuming more and more of this you know this macronutrient right and, I mean, like, and you'd have to try really hard you would have to intentionally go very very hard and specific to uh, to actually not get what you need from it and like we always say just because something is good doesn't mean more is better in fact we see when these when there's a high consumption of these amino acids is these concentrated sources of amino acids like the animal products that that are on the left side of the triangle that's when we get these disruptions in patterns that are supportive of health span and longevity, like, you know, all the, the mTOR pathway and the IGF-1 um, insulin growth, I'm sorry, the IGF-1 growth hormone pathways. That is what, you know, that stimulates all of that into in a bad direction. So more of something isn't good, especially when it comes to something like protein and Again, like you would have to, you'd have to eat like, like you, like I said, white sugar, you know, and oil, like a diet that was primarily very, very refined, all processed. And even still, it would be very, very challenging if you're getting enough calorie, if you're getting enough energy, which almost everyone is right. We've got obesity epidemic, like never before. So most people get too much. Most people get too much. And that's what we always say is that chronic overnutrition is something we're not focusing enough on. So you know, it's, it's, it'd be really challenging and it's just, it's just not something like you said, it takes care of itself. And I think that it makes it so much simpler if people could let go of striving to get enough protein, because what also happens is that on this mission to get enough, I think that is one of the reasons that we're having all these other problems. I think if you're striving and striving and you're, Oh, well, chicken has a lot of protein. Well, you're also getting all these other things. You're getting the excessive amino acids and you're also getting heme iron and you're getting, you know, saturated fat and dietary cholesterol and all these things that we know promote chronic disease. And it turns out, I think maybe this is, that may be one of the reasons why a plant-based diet is so incredibly effective and health promoting is this is probably a big reason is because of what it naturally restricts. And, you know, today we went to lunch with my daughter and it was really amazing at one of the bowls that they had down there and they had you know pick your this pick your vegetable then pick your protein <laughs> you know with tofu this was a plant-based place so it's real food daily so it was you know beans and lentils and whatever but even that is ridiculous I mean if you had menus that say pick your fat pick your carb pick your protein this is just ridiculous this is ridiculous. And what we ought to have is you can add these things to your bowls, you know? I mean, because when it really comes down to it, a lot of the traditional segregation of foods, meaning the various kinds of foods you would see on a plate and the distribution of those foods really came down historically to economic values. In other words, what Wilbur Atwater was really looking at a century ago was the nutritive value of food. He was looking at how could you get the best nutrition for the least amount of cost. Why? Because food a century ago was economically scarce and it was more difficult. So if you didn't have a lot of spare money at that time or spare income, getting very expensive cuts of meat in the day or to a different degree, refined sugar, because it was also expensive. What he was arguing is, hey, look, you can have these beans, you can have these lentils, you can have these you know, cow peas at the time that were very popular. The, the point is, is that you could have these and have complete nutrition and not spend as much money. Today, all food has become inexpensive. And therein lies the problem. That's right. Our access to food today is better than it ever has been in terms of the history of, of humans. And that access to food allows us to make all these choices. But in doing so, marketers 
are still marketing this. We've covered a little bit about carbohydrates and the difference uh, clearly between a simple sugar or a refined sugar and a you know a complex carbohydrate is in a starch starch or a, a food like a potato that has high fiber high water high starch content you cook it so it's more digestible but then we go we've talked a little bit about the amino acid contents the amino acid profiles of plant versus animal foods and you know what the concentration just in terms of the, the concentration you know we talked about you talked about that lean beef versus the potato clearly the lean beef has more um, more protein concentration per calorie more of it is the amino acid than the the potato but if you just ate potato and only potato and you met your calorie needs for the day you would get plenty of amino acid content through the proteins that are in that potato which is why potatoes and rice are protein foods for a very large portion of the world that is economically uh, disadvantaged they end up using those as that so then we move over to lipids because we really haven't talked about those much but clearly saturated fats unsaturated fats no matter what side of the argument you might come down on with this they are metabolically different and of course it seems like everybody hates trans fats at this point you know they're outlawing them everybody hates trans fats so if we can at least agree that trans fats which are still naturally occurring in some animal products you know trans fats aren't the same as saturated fats saturated fats aren't the same as uh, well but trans uh, fats act like saturated fat and that's yeah, what's but, so but, crazy but without getting to that even to that if i just go at the highest level and simply say they're metabolically different i think most people no matter where you come down on the saturated and unsaturated fat uh, argument would say trans fats are met metabolized different than saturated fats. Trans fats are metabolized a little bit different than unsaturated fats. And it's true. Unsaturated fats are metabolized a little bit different than saturated and trans fats. And trans fats actually are very metabolically similar to saturated fats, but they're not identical. And then we haven't even gotten to the chain length. So are they short chain saturated fats? Are they short chain fatty acids? Are they long chain fatty acids? And of course, once again, animals and plants segregate these lipids in fundamentally different ways. So, you know, having covered all three of those macronutrients, all three of the macro confusion, now go look at any study and say, how well did they really control it? Did they really control the simple sugars Versus the complex starches when they were summing up carbs for one arm of the study. No, did they, they never really do. did they really control the chain length of the fats completely? Did they really control the distribution of amino acids? And as you might have heard when we were talking about James Wilkes, when we were talking to him about this, we were talking about over controlling these studies and meaning while they're juggling protein, carbs, and fat to make sure that both sides of the study have exactly the same amounts, they are completely forgetting the idea that if you eat, back to that food triangle, say a paleo diet, which is eat some leafy green vegetables, eat some mushrooms, eat some things up at the top of the food triangle, eat some salmon. Or over on the other side, eat some of those same leafy green vegetables, some mushrooms, maybe garlic or whatever, and have it with some lentils or some black beans or even some quinoa. In other words, as we define these recipes, these food components, what we can do is make them calorically identical on both sides, but protein, carbs, and fat will be different on both sides of that food triangle. In fact, not just different in their percentages, which we then fix by adding oil and sugar to both sides or protein powder or whatever to try to make each side of the, the, of the study balance because we have this arbitrary need to control protein, carbs, and fat. But even going further than this, what we, what we don't do is say, were the saturation and unsaturated controlled on both sides? Was the amino acid concentration controlled on both sides? Were the ratio of simple sugars to complex uh, starches or glycogen if you were eating liver on the animal side? No, it's lumped into fat and is lumped into carbs. And it's literally they and are... protein. Right, but usually we're messing with the protein, with the carbohydrate and the fat. Right. And, well, um, well yeah. no, what they do is they mess the whole diet up because they have to put lean chicken 
breast on both sides of it because the, all they seem to want to balance is the carb versus the fat. Right. So I would say the the vast majority of diet studies put eggs over there, put milk on both sides, put something because why? Well, because the US, they don't fit neatly into these categories. Well, that they're they're trying to do that, but at the same time because the USDA is representing all oh, well, agriculture and we end up saying, well, we want all food groups there. And again, if you're not, I'm not even talking about being against animal products or white rice, okay, or gluten or whatever the hell, you know, your health halo is right now, where you are in your life right now. What I'm suggesting is, is that animal and plant sourced foods concentrate nutrition in fundamentally different ways. And we do have some data about, for example, people who bottom feed. So steak and potatoes, burgers and fries, pasta and meat sauce, curry and rice. When we start looking at all cultures, we see bottom feeding, meaning combining the bottom two calorie dense portions of the meal one of them being primarily fat source the other one being primarily uh starch or carbohydrate source and what ends up happening is your body back to the oxidative priority short term burns the glucose long term stores the fat for later the problem we have in our society that food is so economically uh, available is that later never comes so, you know, as we look at this bottom feeding, as and what, we, what's so interesting, I have to throw this out there too. What's so interesting about bottom feeding is now this is also apropos completely to a plant-based diet because now there are, you know, you could bottom feed easily, way more easy than when I started 15 years ago. So you could easily have a vegan chicken breast and, you know, and vegan fries or, well, fries are always going to be vegan mostly, <laughs> um, or, you know, vegan fried fish and chips. Like but, you can but, do that but now. But, when, but bringing back fries, if someone sees a fry as primarily a french fry as a, as a carb, carb and it's then, it's so infused right. with fat it has nothing to do that's with right, it because it's changed a potato the ratio right has 80 calories per gram mm -hmm. a french fry has 573 calories per gram right. per, per hundred grams i'm sorry 80 calories per hundred grams 573 calories per hundred grams so a french fry mm. is really a fat it's a different animal it's, than no, a potato it's really a fat right. if you were going to categorize it it's a fat you know, it's not a potato anymore. It's not a potato in terms of that. Well, it's still a potato, but in terms of protein, carbs, and fat, it's not a carb because it's primarily fat. That's what where you go. A potato chip, most of the calories in a potato chip are fat calories. Yeah, and so, a donut, so a donut, a cookie. I mean, this is exactly. Right. And so this is what happens. What people do when they say carbs, oh, you're eating all these carbs. <laughs> You know, then what they're really talking about is donuts and even, cupcakes even and cookies. Pizza, even if you think of pizza, pizza, people always put that in the category too. And you think about all the cheese on there, that how it just and completely the wrecks the carbohydrate dose. Right. Yeah. So, so it's really. The, it's the, funny. It, it's, it is. And, and if you think about it, if you step back and not get it personal about it, because it's not personal, it's just what everyone is doing this. And if you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Like we are really messing up everything we talk about food and any kind of possible solution simply by lumping them into these biochemistry right. terms. And, and then also as one moves and we do this in, I don't know what is figure three, et cetera, we show the energy and oxidative priority. But as one, someone moves from bottom feeding to say a paleo style, style diet where they cut out all the, the beans, the rice, the the, the fruit, the potatoes, et cetera, when they do that, they actually do get a lower calorie, overall calorie. Kevin was mentioning this last yep. last um, week when he was talking about, if you haven't heard his uh, his um, interview. Uh, interview, you know, he was talking about the bod pod and he was talking about doing both a keto diet, et cetera, and, and moving from the United States to Europe and all of those things that happened. And it's true. If you go on that left side of the food triangle, you are going to probably have less overall calories and you're going to have less complications from the oxidative priority. On the plant-based side, if you happen to be vegan, there's a bunch of calories you're cutting out on the left, the left side. Likewise, there's a big debate among the plant-based dieters about fat.
fat and like there's a whole camp that says fat is evil fat is bad you can't have any fat you know less than 10% of calories no nuts no seeds no avocado and then there's a whole other slew of people doing Mediterranean where it's like it's fine fat is fine or or vegan keto vegan keto keto, where it's like high doses of fat and here's the here's the kicker on that part of this is that the Mediterranean diet does have a lot of great data there really are a lot of great data um, showing benefits including all of these fats but then we've got people like Dean Ornish you know and Dr. Esselstyn and these people that have actually reversed advanced cardiovascular disease with a very low fat diet so so then that leaves the question well should we have nuts and seeds should we have fat and then it just, it's a very interesting question right and and when you talk about it particularly with the Mediterranean diet when you talk about that diet and actually go back to Ansel Keys work where he was looking at some blue collar workers in Minnesota mm-hmm. versus these people that were primarily agriculture farmers out on Crete. The bottom line here is, is that olive oil was not the salient feature of the diet. It's not that you pour olive oil on stuff and suddenly it's Mediterranean and makes it's it healthy. healthy. Just like, you know, it's not about, you know, as much as we might like a glass of wine, it's not about the wine, it's not about the fish. These were things that were being consumed, but you have to look at the totality of what was happening. And so, for example... But the, I think that dichotomy right there shows that this that none of that matters. Right. That's a perfect example of why we can't start making diet or we can't continue to make diet recommendations based on their macronutrient composition. That, that right there is a conundrum. Right. Because it really is. There's research on both sides of that that are perfectly legit. Great studies. Right. So you can't really justify, you know, making one of those assumptions because we haven't really pit those two against each other we haven't really said okay i'm on a really perfect you know whole food plant-based diet less than 10 percent of calories from fat versus something that includes one to two ounces of nuts and seeds and avocado all that um and looked at parameters and long-term studies so we, we you know we need a lot of research but the whole point is that i don't think it has anything to do with how much fat versus carbs versus protein because that yeah. doesn't seem to the be the ratio probably the doesn't matter yeah. but what probably does matter is that the ratio in animal versus plant source food, depending on what your goal is. Right. You know, of course. are you trying to maximize athletic performance? And this was what was so good about talking with James Wilkes. Yep. Because as an MFA, as an athlete, but also as someone who is very health conscious, he is very quick to say, look, the kind of diet that might get you the best competitive results may not be the diet that wins the longevity marathon. And conversely, the idea of that kind of diet that is great for longevity and health span may not be the best for reproductive prime. Right. So, so it depends these are on trade-offs. Your yeah. yeah. What is your goal? And and this Where becomes are you a in problem, your life? you know, and for us, you know, how we feel, human flourishing we define it very clearly that our goal with the HealthSpan solution, our goal with our diet recommendations, our goal for our clients is to live a long, healthy life that's free of chronic disease, that has the you know maximum ability ability to move around, the maximum physical uh, uh, ability, you know, in terms of sexual function. We have an interview coming up with. Uh, an amazing one of our amazing people from our our retreat and she is uh, a uh, an, an MIT educated urologist but she also specializes in sexual health that's going to be a really and great And she's a big com- proponent of a plant-based diet yeah. and she has she recommends it because well we'll talk about it yeah, it's we'll get really into all exciting diseases, yeah. but but the point here is is that there are many dimensions that one can say I'm trying to maximize. And so, for example, I've had clients in the past that were bodybuilders, and the thing that they wanted to do was shred the body fat right before a competition. And we were able to do that with a high starch diet, just like some people might do it with, you know, just, you know, basically, you know, um, dieting, uh, dieting in a different way. And why this worked is that it actually simultaneously served not only to rip to shred the fat off but to keep the volume in the muscles because glycogen in the muscles you know if you think of the average bodybuilder the phase is eat a lot of food and build okay then what's then lean out cut cut it out get as much fat down 
then volumize with high carbs. We got to volumize and then dehydrate and shrink rack the skin. This is bodybuilding 101. Yeah, it changes a little here or there, but this is mostly what we do. And how those women and men look when they walk out on stage is not how they look in day-to-day life. That's yeah, nor is it how they, nor it's, is it's it usually, I've, I've, I've worked with a bunch of them too, and they always feel the worst when they're walking on stage after going through all of that. Exactly. And, it's not and, healthy. And if you want to do that, like if that's your sport, like I, I don't want to sort of judge person. However, that's probably not the best way to For health span. And even if you do it with a plant-based diet, it's probably not the thing. The kinds of people that were featured in Game Changers, yes, better maybe, yes, equivalent, yes, you can get those performance, but that's probably not going to be the thing that keeps your joints in the best shape for the rest of your life, that keeps you, you know, out of cardiovascular disease, that keeps you avoiding diabetes, that keeps you out of cancer, you know, because the go go grow of reproductive prime ends up turning into the go-go grow of tumors and other cancerous cells, that IGF-1, that growth hormone, you know, that insulin spike. So anyway, so, you know, bringing this to a close, what we wanted to try to do is to talk a little bit about macro confusion, you know, give everybody a taste of what we're going to do. We and can't, the way this, the way this applies, if the way you kind of put this into action, and I know that, you know, the food triangle is a great mnemonic. It's a great description and organization, like a scheme of organization. So you could actually look at it and, and, and analyze things and you could think about things, but when it comes down to, and this is what I was saying prior to meeting you and prior to implementing the food triangle in my language is just to tell people to eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. And that's why we end our podcast and we always say, keep eating right because our goal is health span and the evidence points to a diet that stays on the right side. So, you know, we would re- recommend you look up the food triangle, look at our papers and our book and our books. They're in both of our books now together. And just to think about it because it's it's really interesting and we want... We want to disrupt the way you're thinking. We want you to kind of stop and go, oh my gosh, I'm totally being sold here. Like this is, you know, I don't need to worry about getting enough protein or worrying about high carb, low carb, like none of that matters, none of it. And if that's, you know, when I post stuff like this, I get kind of snarky on my social media because it's kind of fun, um, especially with some fun memes. But if, you know, and that's, that's what we want to do is empower you. And what I've, what I see in my response on social media is people going, thank you. Thank you for saying that because it lets you let go of all of this dogma and all of the stuff you hear and just know that it's not you. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're hearing stuff everywhere because everyone is confused. There is no right answer. You know, I went to school in nutrition. I went to graduate school because I wanted to know the truth. Like, obviously I'm missing something because it's just the, you know, it just, it's so, what am I missing? There's gotta be a secret. There's a secret answer somewhere. And I kept digging and digging and really there isn't, we're all very confused and it doesn't have to be, it really can be the simple. And, and that's what I love about, you know, what we're trying to do is just let's keep this on the plate, really easy, eat a rainbow, eat your plants, don't worry about any of these nutrients. You know, we talk about the notable nutrients, the micronutrients that we need to kind of think about. And we'll talk about that here on the podcast. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, omega-3 fats and the difference in fats. I kind of wanted to get into that, but it's, you know, we'll do that on another day because that's a whole, whole other, whole other um episode. So anyway, we just want you to keep it simple and think about eating, you know, soup, salads, sides, and sweets. And when we look at soups, salads, sides, and sweets, what we're really doing is demystifying it even beyond that. So when we're talking about vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, mushrooms, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices, the fact of the matter is those are those main ingredients that we want you to focus on. And st- yeah, like to- like tra- change the conversation when someone says something to you about where you get your protein or all of that. Just, you know, say, what's protein? That's what we do. We go, well, what? What's protein? <laughs> right. But when we then go even further and say soups, outsides, and sweets, these are all familiar dishes that are cro- cross-cultural. You know, I mean, we know what a, you know, a Russian versus a Thailand versus a Chinese versus an African versus a South American versus a European versus an American soup might be like. We can envision that. And yes, they may have animal and or uh, plant components to them, but we can focus that 
soup really on the plant-based side. That is what our recommendation is because we think that the nutritional profile is better on that side. However, the idea that we're talking about food again, the idea that we're exchanging recipes, the idea that, you know, recipes become the components of a shopping list or become, you know, something that is easily quantifiable or repeatable. If we were able to do studies that focused more on recipes and more on the food triangle and more on left, right, and bottom side feeding, we would probably get a lot better results. So it's really exciting. It is. And not only just better results, but just more obvious results. It just makes sense. And we don't have to look at these studies that say, you know, high carb and a low carb diet, increased mortality and leaving you go, well, what the heck is a high and a low? And how do I find the median? And what? it's just so crazy. And all of these, you know, people calculating all their, you know, their intake every day and not getting any kind of results. It's, it's so frustrating and it's so needless. No protein, carbs and fat in our book, our cookbook. Yeah, no. No nutritional information. No. Just, in fact, the only thing we really compromised on was serving size yeah yeah that was it and we estimated because it doesn't really mean anything doesn't either right? yeah <laughs> if you're doesn't. hungry eat more <laughs> if you're not don't exactly exactly so well this has been a really fun episode live from california thank you for joining us on this leafy green path to good health it's always the food so remember keep, keep eating, eating right, right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucery. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Juliana and Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. Welcome to the first day.